All right, hello everybody. It's the Meister from Brews and Tunes. Cheers. I am absolutely chuffed. I believe that's the correct English term. Uh, I'm very, very excited uh, today. I am chatting with the legendary uh, Deborah Bonham and Peter Bullock of uh, Bonham and Bullock. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, Jeff. Cheers, mate. Hey, Victor. It's Victor, actually, Pete. Did you just call him Jeff? <laughs> no, not at, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. No, I've, I've, you can call me Jeff. Okay. I've, I've, I've been drink, hey, you were just telling us about screwing people's names up, weren't you? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I did classic. the lesson. That was classic. Anyway, it's, it's, uh, you know, as Henry McCulloch once said on the Pink Floyd album, uh, he's a famous Irishman, Henry McCulloch, played with uh, Wings, and uh, oh, yeah. he's the one on the Pink Floyd album that says, I can't quite remember I was drunk at the time. <laughs> right, there you go. Perfect. So I'm, 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 ple I'm pleading the drunks. Nice. Well, good. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, first off, I just have to congratulate you on, uh, so the first single, you have a new album coming out, uh, self-titled uh, Bonham uh, Bullock album, comes out on uh, April 29th, I believe, correct? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, it does. And uh, the first single, which is an Albert King cover, uh, was released just last week, I believe, uh -huh. um, and, and getting a lot of traction, a lot of, uh, a lot of hype right now, which is great. It's a fantastic cover. Um, so I was curious, like... Um, Kind of why did you choose, uh, you know, Can't See What You're Doing um, as, as the, the first release for that, for the album? What, what as, a, as the single, kind of what, uh, what was it like, this there's, is our favorite song or just kind of? Yeah, there's a, there's a simple answer to that. Okay. We didn't choose it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> the record company did, Quarter Valley Records chose it. And, um, okay. and, and the PR guys mainly, you know, it's it was just too hard for Pete and I to pick any song, was it? Wasn't it, Pete? Really, because we love yeah. them all. And um, so we just said, you know, guys, you just pick which one you think will you want to put out. So they were we great. Didn't want, we didn't want to pick one and offend the other twelve. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Right. Yeah, I was just kind of curious. Like I've always kind of wondered, you know, with with singles, and I know oftentimes it is the record company that decides what a single will be, or you know, maybe the the manager or producer of the album or whatever. Sometimes the band does, I'm sure, but um, yeah, yeah so I was just kind of curious what the... They, and, they, they, did, they did ask us, so oh, uh, yeah. we, we, but we, we quite happily let you guys choose because we can't. <laughs> okay, that makes sense. Really, it, it was just, it's a lead track, really, and they just felt that that, you know, that was the one. I mean, it was quite, when we said to everybody, look, which one do you want? Because we can't pick it, you know. Um we loved them all, so it was really difficult to, for us to say. And then they all came back. There was different people, and they all came back with different ones. So right. it was, oh, I'm sure, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so nearly every song had been picked, and it was funny. But then they all landed on um, Can't You See What You're Doing To Me, which was great, and we were happy about that. So, yeah, you know. Great, yeah, great track. Yeah, very cool track. And the thing I think that's really cool about this album um, – you know, we were chatting about it before the before the interview started. You know, and I've been I've been listening to the album. Uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to receive an advanced copy, and I I can't stop listening to it. I, I really love the album a lot. It's it's just uh, it's really compelling. Um, I think one thing that I really love about the album is it's you know it's a, it's a blues rock album, but it's not your typical blues rock cover album where it's not just blues standards. Um, yeah. which isn't a bad thing you know an album of blue standards is great you know lots of performers have done things like that but what fun. i love is you've taken some really interesting songs that normally you would not hear necessarily in a blues vein um yeah. and and what i i also really love about the album is for me kind of the vibe i get from it even though it's you know very modern modern production uh beautiful sound i mean your voice uh is is just so richly textured and and beautiful and, and as well you know and your guitar tones uh peter are fantastic as well um but what i really love about the album is it it kind of reminds me of that older you know kind of late 60s mid to late 60s early 70s kind of english fantastic. blues rock um yeah, you know in the going. 
yeah, in the in the tradition of you know Peter Green's Fleetwood Mac and Jethro Tull, mm-hmm. or early Jethro Tull, and um, you know, and, and Led Zeppelin and uh, you know Free and things like that. It's it's um, I really love it. It it just it it I was transfixed from the first note. And if, you, and if you say humble pie, you've got the full bag. Oh yeah, humble pie. Oh, how can I forget humble pie? Oh my god, what a great band! <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it definitely it has, has that. And even a touch of like you know, uh, like the Joe Cocker Grease Band. It's all that. It's all that kind of blues soul. It, it's not just blues, is it? It's blues with soul and yeah, rock and kind of an attitude and stuff. I think so I squeezed. I think I squeezed a bit of frog in there as well. Like, there's a little bit of Genesis in there somewhere. Oh okay, nice. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's, there's a lot going on, and I, 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 as I said, it's it's such a richly textured album. Um, it's very compelling. It's it's really fun to listen to. And every time you know I listen to it, I find something new about it that I not necessarily missed before, but maybe just stands out a little bit more each time. Um, so I was I was really curious about kind of the the process of putting this album together, choosing those songs, kind of how that came about, and then arranging them. Kind of you know taking th- those arrangements and doing something that's very much your personalities um i was you know i know that's kind of a big loaded question that i just asked but <laughs> no no it, it, it um i mean putting the songs together we had um a few friends send us various different songs hmm. um when we sort of decided that this is what we were going to do and i made it quite clear that i didn't want to go down that road of um uh, of all the real traditional blues stuff because it the reason being it, it's been done quite a lot right. and I just thought you know what no I, I don't want to do that I really want to do something that's um some classics some uh you know some obscure and some contemporary you know and I talked to Pete about it we had a you know the band we all discussed it and went yeah let's let's just not go down the absolute total blues because that's not us you know we mm. are sort of blues soul rock absolutely rooted in the blues all of us right. um, so when I put it out there about the different songs we had about three friends a guy called Gary Nesbitt who was helping us in the beginning over in uh, New Jersey in Princeton and he's like a walking jukebox of all manner of, of stuff so he sent me a load of songs and then we had this, our friend uh, uh, Roy Williams, who was the front of house sound engineer for Robert Plant for years and years and years. And he's a great friend of ours, got involved with us uh, making the, uh, the bronze memorial for my brother John that we did. Um, and sadly, he passed away just uh, at the beginning of lockdown of the pandemic. But oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it was just, he'd had, he got cancer and it was, uh, he passed away, which was very sad. But he, before he, that happened, he sent me about two, two or three discs full of all this great music that he, because he knew the band. And then Robert himself um, said to me, you know, here's a couple of ideas, Betty Harris, you know, Patty Griffin, various bits and pieces, you know. And so we had about a hundred songs, didn't we, Pete? Yeah, and, and we said that's what we wanted to do. All, all these friends started coming up. They, they started enjoying coming up with ideas and stuff. Oh, can we be a part of that? What about this song? Or what about that song? <laughs> and and so it, uh, it all sort of came together, a mishmash of ours and various friends' choices, Gary, Roy, and uh, Robert, really. And, uh, I had all the, the CDs and, uh, well, the links or whatever, and I just, um, knowing what I can do, I mean, it's great getting to this sort of age now because you just know what you can do and what you can't do and what the band can do. And it was really important to all of us, but especially for me, that we um, that we had total respect for the original artist and the original song. And, and that original song still kept its integrity, you know, but we had to bring our own heart and soul to it. So it was... It was for it to, be, to become 13 songs from 100 songs, um, the, the uh, me and the band did, did most of the work by uh, sort of disappearing and leaving Deborah for about three days to choose those while we had to force ourselves to go to the pub to stay out of her oh, way. Um, <laughs> so, so we, 
you know, and that was our contribution. Stay nice. out of Deborah's way <laughs> while she chooses 13 songs out of 100. That's, that's it nearly, dedication. It nearly, it nearly killed us, Victor. <laughs> that's, or can yeah. I call you Brian this time? It, Brian's great, too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's dedication right there, you know, hitting the yeah. ball. <laughs> I didn't have it any other way, actually. But I mean, the thing was, I just, I know, I was producing it. So I know what these guys can do and, and where their heart and soul is. You know, we've all been In together. I've <laughs> been together, yeah, when they're not at the pub, but Pete and I have been together 30 years. You know, um, we, I've known the bass players since we're 16. Oh, wow. Ian, so, um, and the, the keyboard player, Jared Lewis, he's been with us 25 years. I mean, the new boy is the drummer, Richard Newman, and he's been with us 15 years. So, you know, we're a tight, tight, tight band. And yeah. um, so I pretty much knew. And so picking the songs wasn't difficult. It really wasn't. I, I just would go through them and I was very quick to just go, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. And as much as I loved the songs that I was listening to, I just knew it wasn't us and that we couldn't do it. And then bang i'd already picked some myself that i then whittled down and then bang there would be one or two from the other guys as well okay. and can't you see what you're doing to me came from roy and that he he, he sent uh, uh, several songs but that one it just resonated with me because i thought this is something pete can really get his teeth into as a guitarist as well you know um, so that's why why we did it. And it, Pete just looked at me and he went, oh, my God, we're doing Albert King. I said, it's OK, I'm doing a Sam Cooke as well. So we're, we're <laughs> even here, you know. <laughs> but it was, yeah, no, it was great. It was good. It, was not a, it wasn't a hard process to, to whittle them down. The, pro, the harder process was finding the songs in the first place that we definitely wanted to do. That and that's, that's what's so beautiful about it, too, is I think that you know, as, as you said, and, and we were discussing earlier, is that it's it's very eclectic, but it really yeah. all fits perfectly. I mean, it just flows. And, it, you, know, as, you know, on paper, I think if you saw it and said, oh, there's a song by Stephen Stills and there's an Albert King song and there's a Bowie, you know, an old Bowie track, like that's kind of weird. But then when you hear it, it's, and, and there's, there's more contemporary music too on there. And it's like, wow, this really fits. And it, especially because I think, yeah, like, as you mentioned, you've really captured this really cool rock, blues, soul vibe that kind of transfers through the entire album. There's this motif that, that you know, just your translation of those songs, where, as you mentioned, you know, you keep true to the song itself, but you kind of bring this new light to it, which, uh, yeah. you know, I really, really enjoy. It's fantastic. It's, it's, I, I can't. I can't say enough about it. It's such a, you know, I, can't, I can't overstate how great this album is and that everybody should buy it. <laughs> so. Thank you. We'd be very happy about that. <laughs> oh, that's great. I mean, that, that's, you never know, you know, when you're doing something, but I, I got a, when I was listening back, the guys had all gone um, to uh, have a cup of tea. Yeah, yeah right. You know, they'd all gone <laughs> off to, uh, and I was in, um, in the studio and just playing it back and, we pretty much finished the album, you know, um, and I was listening and I really did get that goosebumps feeling. I thought this, we've, we've done, we've done it, you know, because it was just such a heavy weight on all of our shoulders mm. to, to, to bring life to it and to bring ourselves to it and to still have, keep the respect, you know, I mean, when you're taking on Albert King, you're taking on Ovi Wright and, and Sam Cooke and Alan Toussaint, you know, Betty Harris song. And it's weighs heavy. You know, I think it was the most scared I've ever been about doing anything. Because when you write your own stuff, you sort of know, you know, I'll, I'll come up with an idea. I give it to the band. The band do their thing to it. And we pretty much, that's it. We, It's still hard. You know, we have to find the right way. But yeah. And if, and if you do your own song and you do it rubbish, you're not offending anyone. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the same thing. I think that's that's a, that's a valid point. I think, you know, if, if you, I mean, there are covers out there that I know people have been very offended by, you know, that, I mean, you know, big, you know, fans or even sometimes families, you know, of, of the mm -hmm. those musicians where it's like, how could you destroy this song? You know, like, I mean, and I won't name any, but there's a few I can think of off the top oh, of my head. Have, have another, have another beer and then <laughs> <laughs> and start just naming. Yeah, I'll tell you who I hate. Uh, <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> but no, I, I think I think you did, uh, you know, just a, a, a wonderful tribute to all of those musicians and, and those songwriters, I think. And, and but made it your own, which is it, which is important, I think. And I was going to ask you and maybe this is a silly question, but I and especially because, you know, you're and this seems mind blowing to me in some ways. I mean, I understand, you know, the history makes total sense, but it just the, the fact that, you know, Robert Plant picked songs for you. How do you say, now nah, we're not going to do that song to Robert Plant? No, he, he, <laughs> he, 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 look, you know, he's a close friend. Um, right. close, well, there's, there's, a no, there's an old t a comedy show over here, and, and the, the way they would do it, we say, Oi, Robert, no! <laughs> yeah. He didn't, he just made suggestions, you know. Right, right. Um, and he's another, he's another one that is, he, his knowledge of music is yeah. just you know it's 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 crazy what he knows well at, at um, least at least one of them on there is robert's suggestion the paddy griffin one that was oh, nice. two, two of them two of them oh. he, betty harris betty harris and uh yeah oh okay paddy yeah griffin. i always I, I was curious if, if, especially because i know uh that he you know is kind of especially lately and with, with some of his solo work, you know, he's kind of steeped in this Americana, you know, kind of older, you know, kind of folk rock of, of the twenties and thirties and, you know, up into the fifties of, of American music. I know he really likes that a lot. So I, kind of, yeah. I was curious about kind of what his choices were. Um, I was also curious if, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, you had over a hundred songs. Are you, and maybe this is way too early because you haven't even released the album yet. Is there any consideration of a second album and taking some of the not, stuff you put aside? Not from those, not okay. from those songs. I mean, we, sure, there might be a second album if this, you know, we, we have to see how it goes. But yeah, sure, there might be one. But I think all the ones that I listen to, I, I'm pretty instant with what I know we can do and what we can't. And, and I didn't feel that there was really, you know, I, I picked the ones that I knew we could do something yeah, because the, the other thing is that yeah. the, thir the 13 songs we did they're the 13 songs we went into the studio with and did so yeah. Yeah. so but by the time we went to the studio we didn't find out halfway through a song that we couldn't do it or, or okay. we, it, it was yeah. going rubbish or it's we kind of every one of the ones we went in to do we kept and i wouldn't want to you know uh, i wouldn't want to look at any ones that i i turned down in the first you know choice i turned them down for a reason so yeah right. to, to try and resurrect any wouldn't be right you know yeah so fact, the other thing was i, I don't know if you, you remember in the, in the early stages of this album the, the 13 tracks we did we we're in with 13 with the idea of we would choose 11 or we would do 11, the 11 yeah. best mm. for, for an album and uh and of course we, we were really happy with all 13 so it was a, so we couldn't throw two away it was like right. Which is so, great. Yeah. Which is great. I, I like that. That's very cool. And especially now, I think that's it's nice, I guess, in this electronic world we live in now that, you know, albums don't have to be a certain length so much like they did, you know, with, you know, growing up with, you know, tapes and vinyl where it's like there's only enough space for this amount of, you know, this amount of music on this album. I like that though. I yeah, really, I do too. But <laughs> I've got back into vinyl, and I've realised how special it is because you really do sit and listen, and then you have to turn it over, and then you get a whole new experience on side two. So, yeah, I sort of really like vinyl, but I don't know how we're going to whittle it down. <laughs> if yeah. we're going to do vinyl, I don't know. How we, I'm not going to get involved in that one. <laughs> right. Yeah, we, we're going to we're going to have to lose a couple of tracks for vinyl. Mm. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Um, maybe. Just going back Going back to some of the songs, I mean, one of the songs um, of, of Robert's suggestion was Patty Griffin's uh, When It Don't Come Easy. Mm. And that song, I mean, it's the way we've done it is completely different because I, the way she wrote it and, and did the song was just so stunningly beautiful. But it wasn't, I, I couldn't do it that way. It wasn't me, it was Patty. You know, it came from her heart, her soul. But the lyrics just resonated with me. Mm. totally resonated and I, I kept listening to it and I thought we can turn this into a three four time and make it gospel -y blues 
uh, which is what we did. And I swear, I, I, I had a real job because it was one take on the vocal. But when I got it, Pete did the, had already done the guitar solo. And when I was about to come back in, I got tears coming down the side of my face. I was really emotional singing that song. Oh, wow. I managed to get through it because I kept thinking, don't screw this up, Deb, because, you know, the first half of it was so good, you know. But, yeah, I mean, that's a, a typical song that, you know, people wouldn't necessarily see the way we've we've done it because it's completely different but it's yeah. it's our take on it and I, you know i hope that she'll she'll like it you know yeah oh it's it's beautiful i think it's a great song yeah i mean i, I can so see why it would bring you to tears the lyrics are just you know i mean they resonated with me straight away and i think that that's an important thing but i just needed to find a way for us to do it to be us and it just naturally went into that three four <clears throat> blues gospel didn't it pete yeah well uh what me lyrics i was just i'm just out there doing the guitar to get beer and women <laughs> <laughs> honestly <what is> it? <laughs> nice uh, that's I, I was i was i what i really like about the you know in in, in talking about how you picked the tracks i think it's really it's kind of a novel idea. I'm, I'm maybe other people have done it, but I mean, usually when you when you you know an, a, a band does a cover album, it's like, oh, we're going to do our favorite songs. Whereas I think it's a really cool idea that you reached out to you know your your close knit friends, your community, and said, hey, we want to do this album of covers, but we want you to suggest songs to us. So I mean, I don't know if there were any of these songs that came across where you're like, I'm not even familiar with this song. Were, were there any songs? Where yeah. I don't really know the song at all. I've got to say, we, we didn't really ask anyone to contribute songs. Oh, when, they, when, they, when they heard that that's what we wanted to do, yeah. it was oh. all of a sudden the phone rang or we'd meet them in a bar and say, you got to oh, do okay. this one. Or is it? Everybody it's wanted to join in with it. We didn't ask them to, but everybody just came and joined in. Oh, you're going to do that? That's good. You should do this one. Oh, you should oh. do that. So, right. so we hadn't actually asked anyone. <laughs> there was. It was quite funny because you've you've um, you've just mentioned Victor a Bowie song. Well, I didn't know it as as David Bowie. I, I oh. knew it as uh, Ron, oh, Davis. Uh, Ron, Ron Davis. Davis, and I knew it as Ron Davis because um, Maggie Bell and uh, at the time mm. when she was in Stone the Crows sang on this on this song. Okay. So I knew it as that, but Pete knew it as as David Bowie because he, he was a big David Bowie fan. I, knew I it loved was Bowie and uh, Mick Ronson. Who's yeah. a, Mick Ronson who loved, loved his guitar style. Oh, great! So great. when we came to do that song, it was quite funny. We all came from different angles because Pete was going down the Bowie thing, and I was like, no, I don't want to do it. Like that. I don't. Why are you doing it like that? And of course, I'd never heard Bowie do it, and I went, Ah, oh, when I heard it, and I went, Well, okay, scrap that because we're not doing that. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's a much more, it's a very bluesy take on it, which is cool. Whereas Bowie's, you know, of course, has more of a glam. Yeah, yeah well, you know, David Bowie's done his first, he did his version of it, which was fantastic. But it, it wasn't, that wasn't the way we, we it wasn't us, you know. So, right. yes. Um, so Ron Davis, Pete didn't know that Ron Davis had done it. But the one that I really didn't know was The Changeling, which is Chris Wilson. Mm. Very cool. And that came from Gary Nesbitt. Chris Wilson is, uh, was actually passed away, but he was um, a, a very established uh, singer-songwriter in Australia. Mm. And the, the Changeling here, I don't believe he'd ever recorded it, but he'd done it live, just him oh, it's singing. He's a, he was an incredible harmonica player. And he had a voice very sort of similar to J.J. Kale and Leonard Cohen and that type of, you know, dark. that type of voice. Yeah, yeah. dark. Um, and yeah. and he did a, a live clip. I found uh, Gary sent me this live clip of him doing Changeling, the Changeling. And it was just an acoustic guitarist and Chris Wilson who played harmonica on it and it floored me I mean I was floored I just listened to it and I just thought yeah yeah oh gosh I've got to do that and since um his his widow Sarah Sarah Carol Wilson who's a a pretty pretty uh 
established singer-songwriter herself in Australia and their sons. I mean, it's a really multi-talented family. Cool. She's been in touch and she loved it. And that, that meant an awful lot because that was an emotional uh, vocal on that one. You know, recording that had some candles going and we were recording in an old chapel down the road, from us, which is called the Old Chapel Studios, a fantastic place. And um, yeah, that was an emotional one because I knew he'd passed away and he just, you know, some, sometimes you watch somebody and it just gets you and it, he got me completely. So no, I didn't know about Chris Wilson, but I certainly know about him now. Yeah, yeah, very cool song and, and a great finale to the album too. And, and as you mentioned, yeah, kind of a little dark. I mean, you, you get the sense that, you know, I've heard, I've heard the original or the, that live version that you mentioned, I've heard that before. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he, just in his vocals alone, there's kind of this tortured soul yes. vibe yeah. that comes across, which, yeah. uh, but it's very beautiful. It's a very kind of hauntingly beautiful sound. It's uh, dark. I mean, the lyric is dark. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there was a couple of parts that I, I had to edit just because it was a little bit too dark, you know, for a few people, but, you know, a couple of um, uh, people were saying, oh, yeah, that's, that's really is dark, you know. I, I, was very I, I loved it but I, I could see so I did just change it a, a little bit just to make it a little bit easier but um no I mean it was it, I, I was blown away by Chris Wilson yeah, yeah so, so we we took the song and that's when I was just sitting there and I just thought I can hear pedal steel on this and we rang up out he's a great great friend mm -hmm. of ours He's played with absolutely everybody, not least Humble Pie, but that's BJ Cole. Oh, yeah. Uh, Lou Harris, he's played with, oh, a, the list is, is huge. Um, but um, we, both Peter and I have known him for many, many years. And he's played on a few of our albums, you know. Uh, he's just, and he's out there. He doesn't place, you know, sickly sweet um, pedal steel. He really plays it on the edge. So but he goes but, dark as well, doesn't he? He, he goes dark. Some, oh, yeah. yeah BJ's quite a yeah, quite a and, so that's, and that's why you know I just thought I can hear him on this, and gosh, when he played it, we were all sitting there, you know, the, the goosebumps on the arms and everything. Uh, so yeah. yeah, very cool, very cool. Um, uh, let's let's change gears a little bit. I uh, let's go back in time, uh, maybe so a little ways back, um, and and maybe we'll start with you, Peter. I was curious how you originally got started in music and started playing guitar did you come from a musical family um kind of where is what are your roots in terms of, of music well i was probably about seven years old i had a, um, an uncle who's three years older than me so and he got a guitar aged about 10 so that was it i had to get i had to get the same things as he did and all that kind of you know right you know any any clothes any shirts or any any bell bottom trousers i had to get them so so i, I was being three years younger I, I looked like a very early starter compared to everybody else but i was right. basically i was basically copying him and uh and then we used to go rummage through uh his old he's my uncle so his his older sister is my mother so Oh, and he had okay. two other sisters. And we'd rummage through their record collections, which would be, you know, the Beatles and the Stones. And and then it was like Free and uh, Bad Company and Rory Gallagher and stuff. So we, cool. we started rifling through all their records and getting into all that kind of thing. And then we'd try and copy it on our guitars, aged between 7 and 11 and stuff. And, you know, and eventually, you know, the first year was an, a very cheap acoustic guitar. The next year was an electric guitar, which was, which was uh, 25 bucks. You know, and it was, uh, uh, and then I had to wait another year before I could get an amplifier for it, you know, and then, and then th things just sort of took, took a little while to blossom, you know, every year it got a little, every year we got a little bit better and we got a little bit better equipment and, and then we started going to the shows and stuff aged about 12, 13, we'd sneak into the Ulster Hall and see uh, Rory Gallagher and there was an Irish band oh, cool. called uh, Horse Lips, who mm. were very much like sort of proggy folk kind of thing. But the guitarist was like a blues guitarist playing over the top of folk prog kind of rock. But he'd play a, a Les Paul. Now? What? What was his name? Johnny Fiend. Johnny Fiend. That was it. Johnny yeah. Fien. Okay. He had a yeah. long hair player, played play a Gibson Les Paul gold top. Uh, very, very like Kossoff, who was uh, my oh, other yeah. son here, Paul Kossoff. You know, it's, it's all that sort of Les Paul kind of thing. Cool. cool. Uh, and just. 
bend in a note and vibrato in it. And we, we you know, aged 11, we were, you know, sort of <laughs> com competing with each other on who had the best vibrato, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> That's great. I love that. that I would imagine I was, uh, you mentioned free and, and bad company. And of course, you know, fast forward, you have played with Paul Rogers multiple times back in yeah. the band. I, I would imagine maybe that first gig with Paul Rogers, did you ring up your uncle and say, holy shit, I have something to tell you? <laughs> well, he, he actually said that, Lord, strike him down, it should have been me. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, he said, Lord, strike the wee bastard down, it should have been me. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. The wee bastard down. <laughs> he did. Oh, bless him. That's funny. Oh. And yeah, what a wow. What a, I mean, and you've, you know, obviously you've played with a lot of different people, but yeah, I mean, that's, I'm, I'm a massive free and, and bad company. I mean, Paul Rogers, what a, what an incredible singer yeah. that man is. Um, but yeah, how cool. Wow. That's, that's really yeah. cool. It was like, I, I don't know if, it, I, I, I guess not many people get to play with their absolute childhood hero. So it's, uh, yeah. But I, I, I don't know how to really sort of take it because because uh, I ended up playing with him. So that's it's kind of a, I don't know, it's almost like a fairy tale story, isn't it? But it's a, it, 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 happened, for, it happened, yeah, it happened for real in my case. So I, 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 it's, um, I think it's, it was a massive accolade as well. You know, I mean, for him to have chosen you and the band, really, but hmm. especially you, yeah. when so many other guitarists so wanted to to, to do that, you know, and it, oh, and it yeah. you big. Yeah, I think that speaks volumes. I think you, you can give yourself a pat on the back there, Pete. I think you can. Yeah, it's good. I didn't actually ask for the gig. He asked me. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow, that's even bigger. That's really you, cool. You, you have to check your diary, Pete, see what you were doing. Yeah, so, all right. Sorry, Paul. I might be busy. I'll just check, see if I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. What are the hours? How many pencil, yeah. many pencil you in? I'll see if I, I can. First, I think the first thing you said was, yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah that's a, that's incredible that's so cool and then obviously deborah you i mean the, you know very obviously you know your brother was john bonham the amazing mm -hmm. legendary drummer of led zeppelin uh but i was did you come i mean apart from your brother was your family musical was your father a music musician no no oh. they loved music they really loved music and my mom yeah. always wanted to be in music when she was young you know but it, she was born in 26 and, you know, ended up getting married and having us kids and everything. But, uh, yeah, they, they used to play a lot of great music. And that's where John got his love for Gene Krupa, because mum and dad always played Benny Goodman, all the big bands, you know. Um, so, yeah, music was always being played, always. But they, they weren't particularly a mu uh, musicians. I mean, mum actually got into, uh, we, Pete got her a gig when she was 80 with a band called the Zimmers over oh, here. Wow. That's really cool. <laughs> As in a Zimmer frame, you know, but um, they got so they got a bit of notoriety, you know, and um, she was asked to go and uh, sing in the studio. And she was, oh, I, you know, oh, I don't think I can. And I said, mom, you've wanted to do this all your life. You know, you're 80. I think it's about time you had it go. Yeah, so that's she, cool. she went in and sang, um, she sang We Will Rock You and she sang The Beatles, Let It Be. I and it was love that. So we played it at her funeral. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. <laughs> that's really cool. Yeah. And all the yeah. money they raised went to Age Concern for, for older people. So it was really, it was all done for charity. That's you know? like a charity band, all this. And, uh, and she got me the gig in it as well. When it came to the yeah. guitar solo for Let It Be, she says that she's still the producer. No, I want my Peter to do the solo for this. <laughs> 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 she, she turned into quite a diva, didn't she? Oh, yeah. <laughs> she did, bless her. Oh, no, she, got she, me the gig, she got me the gig with the old pensioners. That is great. <laughs> that's, that's so cool. That's right. What a know, great story. Yeah, well, she, I mean, she got a lovely voice and, and you know, she totally sang in tune and, and she had a, a beautiful tone and quite low and, and, yeah, no, she had a beautiful voice. Nice. So she got to do her bit at 80. But apart from that, no. I mean, they just loved music. Cool. So, um, but I guess because I was so much younger, you know, I'm 14 years younger than John. Right. And my brother Michael, he was 12 years older than me. So Michael and John were very close in age, you know, two years between them. So they were like this um, together. 
and then I, I came along later. So I came into to John playing all of this incredible music and Michael. So they would be playing just about everything, all the Motown stuff, all the Stax music. Um, oh, cool. You know, all the soul stuff, but also all the uh, all the West Coast vibe, you know, Crosby, Stills and Nash and & Young and Joni Mitchell and Fleetwood Mac. And, well, actually, Fleetwood Mac were earlier on. They played all the blues stuff. So it, Hendrix, Joplin, the whole lot was going, it, James... It, 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 you, you age six, didn't John sit sit you down and say, listen to this and put on the Hendrix album when you were six no, years old? No, when I was six, no. I was about 16 then. Six, that six, was, no, that, yeah, well, no, that, that no, would have been... Story uh, wrong. No, what happened? What happened was he... Um, but you were 16 in 1978. Yeah. You, well, you would have heard you, of Hendrix 10 years before that. No, I hadn't really played any Hendrix. Really? Oh, right. Really? What, what oh man, that's a divorce. That's, uh, <laughs> I'm, tell I'm off to the bar. This is. I'm, I'm, <laughs> can I tell my story, or are you going to tell it for me? I was six, sixteen. Well, I've been heard of Hendrix ten years after. Oh, Look, I had heard of him, but I hadn't really sat down and played it. What happened? My sister-in-law Pat, Patricia, uh, John's wife, she'd gone away uh, for a couple of days with her sister. And so mom and I were looking after Jason and who was only a few years younger than me and Zoe, um, who was a baby, at the, the young, uh, you know, toddler at the time. John had gone down to the pub and I'd gone into the, the you know, the, the, the panel room, you know, the bar room. And he had all of his albums, uh, vinyl, all stacked up and all in, in uh, alphabetical order. And I thought, great, you know, I mean, because when back at, in, in, at that age, you, you sort of just saved up your pocket money to get your old albums. And there, there I am looking at massive, all these albums. I thought, brilliant, I'm going to work my way through. So I'd worked all, all the way through and got to H and found Hendrix. And I put Hendrix on, on the stereo and he had the most incredible stereo, John. It was that, what was Mac that, mate? Mac Macintosh. Macintosh. Oh, my God. Goodness, the sound on these spin, the huge big speakers. And I put this on, I went, oh, oh my goodness. The speakers were EV speakers brought, he brought over from America. Giant, they were giant huge, EV. great yeah. big things. So, and I had it absolutely turned up, you know. And I was just there, mesmerized by what this guy was doing. And John came back from the pub early and he came through the door and I thought, oh, God, I'm going to be in trouble. And he went, oh, you're listening to Hendrix. And I said, yeah, I've just found this, you know. He said, hold on a minute. So he went off and he got this big, came back down with this big sort of machine thing that, um, you know, looked, would, would be prehistoric now. But it was the, the startings of VHS or Beta Max or whatever. But it oh, was right. huge. It was huge. But he had this, um, this, this, this big cassette thing and he put it into the machine and it was um, Hendrix at the Isle of Wight. Oh, wow. And the, and the pair of us sat and, um, and he said, watch this. And he had such um, enthusiasm for it, you know, because he loved Hendrix. So he sat there and I'm watching it with him. And he went and got himself a drink. And I think, I don't think he actually offered me one, but I know I snuck a dram Buey. I remember. <laughs> I remember getting a little dram buey <laughs> and sitting there watching this with him and it was just ph phenomenal. Yeah, it was great. So that's the Hendrix story. That's very cool. Did you have a, uh, you know, when, when Led Zeppelin broke, you know, it was you know the late 60s, 68, 69, and you would have been pretty young, you know, eight, you know, uh, eight yeah, nine years six, old, probably. Seven. Did you have a sense of what was going on with your older brother? I mean, or was it just like, oh, he's off doing whatever? Or did you have a, this realization like, wow, my brother is huge? No, I mean, listen, I, I mean, I was listening to them when I was six. Hmm. I mean, I, my sixth birthday party was at our village hall and John and Robert played. Wow. <laughs> got up and played. Of course, all my little six-year-old friends hadn't got a clue what was going on, you know. Yeah. <laughs> But, um, and then when Led Zeppelin 1 came out, I actually loved it, you know. Um, oh, yeah. and so my little friends used to come around and on would go Led Zeppelin 1 and then it would get to Dazed and Confused and when it got to the fast part, you know, the little, 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 then I'd just look at my little friends and go, right, 
dance, dance, and <laughs> go, go dancing. You know, so, so I've been listening to it forever. Yeah. Um, and just loved it, you know, from the minute I, I first heard it. But I guess I really understood when I first went to see them. And they were playing a small, well, it was 2000, about a 2000 seater in, in the middle of uh, the UK in Birmingham called the Birmingham Odeon. And um, I just remember sitting there and, and the, there was a, an upstairs, you know, like balcony tier of, uh, of seats and, and everybody was hanging over it in the head, you know, all, all doing this dancing and the head shake. And I was just looking up going, oh my goodness, you know, real wide eyed and just totally watching this band and forgetting actually it was my brother because it was just something else. And I right. think that's probably when the world changed a bit for me because I, from that moment, I just thought, I want to do that, you know. Oh, okay. so that was kind of the, the that epiphany, you, watching your brother play. Yeah. I want to do this. That's yeah. cool. That's cool. And I know kind of Robert Plant kind of took you under his wing, correct? And uh, you started well, recording as a teenager, I, I mean, right? I think he not quite took me under his wing. I think like, we used to hassle him so that we could go and use his studio, bless oh, okay. him. So uh, Jason and I would, you know, we'd phone up and go, Robert, can we come around? Because <laughs> he lived in the next village. <laughs> and he had a... He had a, uh, a little studio in his barn, you know, um, and so, and I wanted to see if, if I, you know, if I could even do the, you know, if I could even sing properly or whatever. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I, he, he took me under his wing, but certainly he let us go and see, you know, see how we, how we could do. Jason was obviously phenomenal. I mean, he was just like incredible when he was a kid, you know, he just... And we hadn't noticed when we did these demos, it was when we went to pull back, there was a real big rustling going on. And the engineer was going, well, could, you know, I don't know what that is. I can't find it. We discovered it was Jason playing with drums. He must have been about 15. And he was playing with one hand. We didn't even know him. He was playing, playing the drums so incredibly with one hand that most drummers could, wouldn't even dream of with two. So there's Jason with one hand while the other hand is rustling in a crisp packet, <laughs> like, you know, chips. So uh, he's got these crisp, and he's eating those as he's playing, you know. <laughs> so, so yeah, it, we, we um, that was where we cut our teeth really. And then Robert said, um, okay, Look, you know, if you if you want to have a go at this, he said, you've got to go and pay your dues. You you do. So you you've got to get out and play live. That's what you have to do. Yeah. And um, so yeah, that's what that's what I went and did, and been doing ever since. Nice. And your early stuff, especially you know your first album, the uh, for you in the moon, was <laughs> uh, kind of more of a pop oriented album. It, it reminds yeah. me not vocally, but just musically, it reminds me a little bit of like you know, kind of that that like Stevie Nicks, her solo stuff in the, in the early eighties, a little bit has kind of that vibe to it a little bit. Um, and it's good, really good stuff. It's great stuff. But I was wondering kind of what was that transition from that sound to more and kind of a heavier blues sound. Um, well, I'm glad you like it. Cause uh, you know, um, I always get shocked when anybody tells me that they like it. I'm like, oh, All right. okay. All right. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't me, you know, certainly I think Stevie Nicks was a, a, a definite um, uh, influence on me because I, I certainly, and to this day, I love her because I think she was just an amazing front woman yeah. with, a, with a, a real soulful voice, you know, I mean, I, I absolutely thought she was great, it, you know, loved her to death, but what happened with that album was um, it wasn't like that at all, the way I'd written the songs. I was a bit more Joni Mitchell-esque, really, oh, I guess. I loved all of them. I loved Anne Wilson, you know. I mean, I loved yeah. these girls. Um, but I I think I also, I loved Aretha Franklin and Anne Peebles and all of that. So when this happened um, and I signed to Career Records, they sent me out to Germany. And the album was, it was sort of taken away from me, really. I had nothing to do with it except to, to just walk in and sing. The whole songs were changed into this real 80s pop rock, you know, um, which I guess at the time, I mean, it, it did really well. And um, I guess they knew what they were doing. It just wasn't me. Yeah, um, it was unfortunate to, I mean, yeah, it's it's a good album, but I, I think, yeah, it's it's a very different 
you know, when you hear it compared to what you do now and and, and the, the albums afterwards um yeah. yeah it's very different sound it's you know i wouldn't yeah. if you didn't it know it you wouldn't uh, initially recognize that it's deborah bonham you know be like yeah. who is this no. It, it, it just, it, it really wasn't me. And, you know, I mean, it, it was under the, the moniker of Debbie Bonham. And that's really why I, I, I've, I've, go, I've gone back to my real name, which is Deborah, because it's just quite childish, that album. I, I, it's just nothing, it's, it's nothing for me, you know, so. Although it is, it is popular in South America, even to this day. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Do not have any ideas of me touring that album in South America. <laughs> doing it. I have, know you ever, have you ever considered uh, playing any of those songs live and, and, and changing the arrangement? We did do one of them uh, for oh. You and the Moon, the title track. We did oh, do okay. recently. Well, a few years ago, we, we put that in, didn't we? And uh, that was it. It, it kind of worked. It was, uh, and, and it gives some, some of the audience to have that album. So they, they loved, it, loved hearing it. Cool. The, th the thing is, you know, we're at a stage now where we're sport for choice on, on songs. You know, with, when you do a live show, usually uh, we do about one and a half to two hours um, at, the, at the most, if we can, if we can. And there's only so many songs you can you can pick, you know. Um, so it, it's quite difficult finding them uh, because we, there's so many of them that we like and then we 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 play them and think, oh, we, we should do this next time. And then it's like constant, re you know, having to get together because I'm, I'm saying to everybody, can we put this in, in the set? And they're like, oh, okay, <laughs> you know. Um, like, no, no, let's do last week's set and we'll just go to the pub. <laughs> yeah, that's you. <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing really on for you. I just say, when we, we, we have a rehearsal room and whenever we, we all go, we all come from all angles of the country and all descend in our place to the rehearsal room, and it and we we get in there, we switch things on, and then as soon as the drummer Rich sits down behind the stool, he hits one drum and then he says, "Shall we go to the pub now?" <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's Honestly, funny. but How yeah, did... I, mean, I mean, and and you know, the way I look at it is, that's in the past, you know. I mean. I was I was I was young and I was in the it, that that's a, a part that happened. I'm not I'm not embarrassed by it. It's just that you know they were trying to make me into something else. I mean I remember doing this um, this this TV show, and I'd I'd been specially taken out to uh, these shops in London by a, a, a professional you know uh, costume you know dresser to to, to, oh. to Whatever you call them, they would, would sort of mistress. not a wardrobe mistress. No, they de they decided what I was going to wear, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, okay, all right." So I went along with it, and I remember standing in this TV. Fluffer. Will you do you stop it? <laughs> I was standing. In, I was standing in this TV theater, um, and uh, studio rather, and. Um, I'm stood in this these very high heeled shoes, which people tell you. I, I mean, I'm I'm a barefoot girl, you know. I, and they they've got me in these high heeled shoes and this short um, chamois leather dress, and I'm just stood there thinking, "Oh my God, what, <laughs> what am I doing?" You know. Um, yeah. Doesn't wear it, them I, anymore. You know, <laughs> I do. I do. I was, a, I was a complete fish out of water on all of that, you know. And I'm sort of glad. Well, I am very glad. I can't even that, remember what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really glad that it, that it, it didn't take off hugely back then because I think things would, the been, would, things would have been very wrong for me, you know, if that had, if it had, you know, really, really taken off. And it, it didn't. And I'm really glad it didn't. Gotcha. I wouldn't let you. And look how, how desperate I would have been then. <laughs> I was curious, how, how did you two meet? Was it, was it through music? How did you two get together? Because you've been married for quite some time, uh, correct? Yeah, 20, um, 20, 20 odd years, Pete. We've 20. been together 30, okay. 30 long. I don't know, we, we, we were just together for like another year dur during that answer to that last question, I think. We just, 
we just totted up another year's worth of marriage there, I think. Oh. Are you saying I talked too long? <laughs> you're a cheeky devil, honestly. <clears throat> and we you just we met, in, met in 90, uh, just, just a, a couple of days before 1991, so 31 years together. Cool. You're just jealous because yeah. Victor and I are sat. Victor and I are sat with a, a, a glass of something, and you're desperate to get to the pub. So that's you're just jealous. So I'm going <laughs> to. I'm getting texts here. Say I'm getting texts here. Said we're on our third pint. Where are you? I'm going to check this out as long as I possibly can. <laughs> oh, this is cruel. This is torture. <laughs> uh, anyway, yeah. How did we meet, Pete? Um, at a, a friend's wedding. Oh, okay. I knew the groom. He knew the bride. When she used to rock and roll, and um, we—he was the band. He, he had a, a, a pretty uh, backside-kicking bar band that was playing stuff like Georgia Satellites and oh, okay. Tom Petty and goodness knows what. And they offered to be the band for the night as a as a wedding gift for the, the celebrate, you know, the evening celebration. So when I got there, I heard that he was playing and I heard him play one note I couldn't see him but I, I could hear somebody play this note and I thought wow there's some great soul in that one note he's playing <laughs> so um the second one since <laughs> <laughs> yeah you don't only play that one note yeah but <laughs> you do quite well you've got about three now that are good so um <laughs> so he um, so the, the 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 groom said to me, um, "Would you would you get up and sing with them, Deb?" And I said, "Well, if the band are okay about that, yeah." So I got up and sang, and that was it. I Very think cool. he said, "Time in, are you going to kiss me or not?" And that was it. He was incredibly, um, <laughs> what would you call yourself, Pete? <laughs> Gallant, not. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. He just said, "I put the time in with you, so are you going to kiss me or what?" And wow. That was. That's you sure the word was you sure the word was kiss? It was. <laughs> the, please don't be rude on this. <laughs> nice. Well, that's cool. Though. I mean, it's really cool that. I mean, yeah, music did bring you together at a at a wedding. I think that's a, that's that's yeah. pretty cool. And, uh, that and it's cool that yeah, you heard a note on a guitar. I went, oh, who's that? What? Who's doing that? I want to. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely did. And the funny thing was, I was with a bass player at the time. Um, that I was in a band with and I did turn to him to Wayne Terry my my very long 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 friend and I said I'm it's very marry short you. actually uh <laughs> he is he, he's, he's five foot oh wow so, so it's he's funny really she's not. a long long friend <laughs> <laughs> I said to him listen I wish I hadn't said it now <laughs> I said I'm gonna I'm going to marry that guy. And he said, oh, God, no, Deb, don't do that. And I said, why? He said, he's a drunk Irishman stood on the stage. You don't want to marry him. And I went, oh, dear, OK. And that was it. We were together, and that's where we've been ever since. Nice. And and you complement each other incredibly well musically. And, uh, of course, um, I mean, yeah. what a, a, Yeah. I mean, what a great band. Uh, what a great album this new album um and i it, it's been a real pleasure chatting with both of you i do i do have one last question um yeah. so as you may or may not know i don't know if you keep know my, coming, keep oh, them coming we're, we're going to torture peter here all right well this might torture him some more because it's about beer so it might, it might um so i don't know i don't know if you know or not my my blog my page is called bruising tunes i pair uh craft beer with hard rock and rock and roll and heavy metal um so uh my my question is uh so it's a saturday evening uh you're hanging out at home what uh what beer are you cracking open and what album are you spinning what's what's your pairing well mine is um i'm actually drinking a, a beautiful organic white wine mm. um that it, it's uh, absolutely lovely and i'm listening to an album called uh the Sharecropper's Son by Robert Finley. Oh, nice. I don't know if you've heard that. 
Um, I recently got that as a birthday gift and it's absolutely, I, I love it. It's my favorite album at the moment and I've got it on vinyl because Pete has set me up at my vinyl, our vinyl table, Excellent. a turntable, and I'm loving it. Absolutely loving it. Fantastic. Oh, and I should mention and my guitarist that I played with on the Stars Align tour that Pete, when Pete was playing with Paul Rogers mm -hmm. and I would open up the show with a guy called Ian Hatton, and um, Ian is a long-term friend of mine. I've known him since I was about 15. And Ian, we were in a band together years and years ago. And then he joined Jason, my nephew, in the Bonham Band. Oh. And they, yeah, they did really, really well. And Ian, um, he came and played, you know, with me to open up the, the, the Stars Align tour. But he is making his own craft beer at the moment. Oh, very so cool. It, it, apparently, it, it Up, tastes upstate fantastic. New York. Upstate New York, and he's coming over next week, and I'm going to see him. And I've said to him, bring me some of the beer, bring the beer. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think that should be your choice, your beer choice, Pete, maybe, once you've tasted well, it. Well, it would be Ian Hatton's Tats. Uh, we, we call him Tat. Uh, we could, it would have to be his beer, but uh, when I can't get his beer, it's Summer Lightning. Summer uh, Lightning. I've heard of that. It's a, it's a strong brew we get. Mind you, America's doing a lot of strong brews now. When yeah. we were on that uh, American tour with uh, Paul Rogers and Jeff Beck and Ann Wilson and Deborah opening up, we did about nine weeks throughout the States, and they were doing like big big shows, amphitheaters and stuff. And uh, we'd, we'd have... The most we'd do would maybe be three shows in a row, and then we'd have one or two days off or something. And uh, and uh, the standard procedure was it was just on days off. It was just basically hit the bars, and th there was oh, I wish I could remember which bar it was. They had something like ninety nine different brews. Oh wow! And um, and uh, we we nearly did them all in one night. But, uh, <laughs> we <laughs> we tried really hard. But I remember back in the, the 90s or the 80s and stuff, the, the, the American beers, where the people from our, the rest of the world used to, they weren't too pleased with American beers back then. Yeah. But um, the, lately, I don't know, the last 10, 20 years or so in America, the, the, the beer has become uh, some of the best in the world, hasn't it? You get those, uh, we, we were drinking, uh, we'd, we'd go to LA, we'd go to, um, uh, well, God, what's that place that uh, Colombo used to? Barney's Beanery. That was Barney, it. Barney's. We'd go down to Barney's Beanery and we'd drink Fat, fat Tire, a beer oh, called yeah. Fat Tire. Yeah. Fat and we'd tire. drink that by the jug. You get a four pint jug of that, you know, and it's that. We just get more Fat Tire. And then, <clears throat> then New Jersey, we were there for a week. Uh, and we were drinking uh, Yingling, which apparently oh, yeah. is uh, what, one of the oldest breweries in the States, Yingling. I think it is the oldest brewery that yeah. still exists. Yeah, that's still brewing. Yeah. So we got well into that at the Anchor Bar in uh, Asprey Park. That's uh, right. we used to drink Actually, whenever we, we were right there in tour. We love that craft beer up in the Midlands as well, don't we? Where I'm from. And we go up there quite regularly, you know, see Abrams. family. Uh, the, no, the Sway, the, the Y Valley one. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Beaudley Brewery. Yeah, yeah. They, yeah, yeah Beaudley. Okay. The brewery is fantastic. And the, um, that's, a, that's in the black country in the Midlands. Uh, and Robertson. Robertson does that. Does oh, great yes, Robert, Plant, Robert Plant's son's got a brewery. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, and they, uh, what, what's the brewery called? But I know I know what the beer's called. The beer's called uh, uh, Neck Oil and uh, Gamma Ray. And the brewery's good. Beaver Town. Hmm? Beaver Town. Beaver Town Brewery. Check that out. Okay, yeah, I will. And that beer's really that. good. I, I like the gamma ray, which is the strong one, but the uh, the the neck oil is a uh, is a medium sort of four percent kind of strength. I think I think gamma ray is near a six. I think his his granddad used to call having a, a pint and some neck oil. You know, oh, okay. oil. That's, it. that's the name. Oil. Old neck yeah. oil. Yeah, he right. named neck oil after his grandfather. I think that's great. I love that. That's fantastic. I will definitely look into that. That's very cool. So you said, what, sorry, what was the beer? The lightning. Summer Lightning. Summer Lightning. And so what would you pair that out? What what album would you would you listen to? What 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 are you spinning while you're drinking Summer Lightning? Summer Lightning, it has to be uh, John Travolta and Olivia Newton John. No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's summer frightening. <laughs> um, crikey, pairing that up with an album. Well, I'm usually in the bar at the time drinking oh, okay. that. 
So, uh, crikey, we've been uh, on the way on the way over to Belfast, where, where I am at the minute, helping my sister move house. But uh, we drove up from south of England, up through England and across on a, on a boat from Liverpool over to Belfast. And uh, we had absolute rock radio on. on the, oh. the it was, And it seemed to play all my childhood records. It was uh, Kansas, Carry On My Wayward Son. Nice. There was REO Speedwagon. There was... Uh, you know, heard it from a friend who oh, yeah. it, it was Journey, there was Steve Perry O'Sherry, there was Craig that Scorpions, it was just bang, bang, bang after it. All all the sort of 70s, 80s rock that we used to listen to. It's as kids. quite funny when, when we do this together at home. I mean, we quite often do that. We'll we'll open up a bottle of something, we'll like beer or wine or whatever. And we'll put on music here. We do it a lot, and certainly through lockdown, Pete built an outside oh, yeah. bar. He built this outside bar and uh, we completely oh, cool. forgot we were outside because we'd have the music full on, singing our hearts out to, to Kansas, you know, carry on my way with sun. Then we'd have... Boston, um, Boston more than a feeling, that's all I remember. Oh, yeah. and, and then, of course, um, Hollywood Nights, that was our other one. Oh, yeah. It was and amazing. We, we've had we've had the, this, this the free bird head buying at the yeah. at the end of the night. Some right, you got to, right? It was amazing how you know he'll take it down the, the, the rock side, which which I love too. But then I'd go back with some spinners and rubber band man, you know, and then we'd oh, okay. start dancing around to rubber band man. <laughs> yeah, no, it's we regularly do that, don't we, Pete? And then then we meet in the middle with uh, little feet. Oh, little feet. Oh yeah, we did. Little feet, yeah. fantastic. That is great. I, I think that. actually, not now that you now that you, we've gone through that, I think summer lightning is paired with little feet. Oh, okay. So uh, because I drink with our keyboard player Jared oh, G yeah. G Lewis, he's uh, he's a big little feet fan as well. So uh, and he loves summer lightning. So the pair of us go out and drink summer lightning and sing little feet. He also loves the spinners. So he comes onto my side as well, although, you know, <laughs> I'm there for little feet as well. I'm right. totally <laughs> that is great. I love that. Well, uh, Deborah and Peter, this has been a pleasure uh, and an honor chatting with you. Uh, for everybody watching, please, if you'll look in the description below, you'll see links to uh, the Bonham and uh, Bullock page and definitely check out the album. Uh, go to you know, Quattro Valley Records. Um, it it's comes a, it's out. A it's Cordo, it's Cordo Valley Records. Oh, Cordo. Oh, yeah. oh sorry. I've... And there, there is a pre-order link ready oh, great. for, for the album now as well. If you... Yeah, and the yeah, album this... comes out April 29th. 29th, yeah. Um, so yeah, please, everybody, check this out. It's it's fantastic. Um, I can't say enough about how great this album is. So yeah, if you, if you love the blues or and rock um, and just great music in general, then you should definitely check this album out. So thank you so very much. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Thank you, Victor. Yeah, cheers. Lovely. Cheers to you. Cheers. My hand's empty at the minute, but <laughs> five minutes time, this will be full. Awesome. <laughs> Great.